Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I don't know about you, but I found that last panel about women and Islam very moving. But we're now going to be talking about another issue to do with women, which is the new generation of women, the rising generation, the young generation. What has shaped them? What do they want? And how are they different from the current generation of you lot sitting here in the room? And it's an issue which is of great interest to me because apart from my day job, which is US managing editor of the Financial Times, um, my other job is that I'm the mother of two young girls myself. And I can't think of a better person to talk about this than Norina Hertz, who, like me, is British. She is an economist, a thought leader, an author who's written recently in the Financial Times and the New York Times, but also has been looking at an absolutely fascinating question of this new generation of young women. This is not the millennial generation. This is a generation even younger, who were born between 1995 and 2002, 2003. And you've called this Generation K, Generation Katniss, which I think is a great, great idea. I wish I'd thought of it myself. <laughs> But hey, I'm a journalist. I will pick up ideas from anywhere. <laughs> um, but tell us first of all, Noreen, what made you look at the question of how generations shape what people think? Because a generation is not just people who were born around the same time. It also tends to be people who share similar values, life experiences, hopes and fears. So what made you look at Generation K, as you call them? Well, as you say, we are profoundly shaped by our own experiences. And as a society, we are shaped by our collective experiences. And in my work as a professor, um, teaching young women and men, I started realizing that this generation, aged 13 to 20, were distinctly different to the previous generations. They've been shaped by forces that are pretty damn unique. Um, technology. I mean, this is the generation who has grown up, come of age alongside Facebook, Twitter, the iPhone. They don't know of a world beyond where, where we don't have the internet. They, they don't know of a world um, of not being logged on. Uh, they don't know of a world of not communicating through emoticons. No. They, I get messages from my daughter, and I literally need a translation. They are really visual. I mean, that's something that my research has found. They're very visual. They communicate increasingly through shapes, through symbols, rather than words, which has ramifications for us journalists but, um, and writers. But they also, I try to understand why, um, why they were on their phones all the time. Why, when one girl dropped her phone into the toilet, for her it was the worst thing I've ever experienced. It was awful, she told me. Yeah, so you wrote a great piece in the Financial Times about this, saying that, you know, she talked about dropping her phone in the, in the toilet as if it had been a personal trauma. Yes, and, and I, tried to, I tried to understand why. Why was it so devastating? And she explained, I think, really eloquently to me what it means for her generation, the smartphone. She said, for me, it's how I am connected to my friends, to my family, to the news. For, her name was Jen. For Jen, it was as if I connect, therefore right. I am. Right. Very, very fundamental to her identity. Probably we should just stop for a minute and say, is there anybody here in the audience today who considers themselves to be part of this generation Katniss? Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> Hooray, we've got them. Hey, well, we ought to have you up here as well, waving your, <laughs> waving your phones. Or even better, we should take your phones away from you for a minute <laughs> and see how you react. Um, any of you out there in the audience consider, consider yourselves to be millennials? <laughs> okay, bad news. Narina, you and I are outnumbered. Oh, Gillian. But, I mean, tell us, why did you call them Generation K, Generation Katniss? Yeah. What was the... Because those of you, any of you who are old and crumbly like myself, um, will know that Generation Katniss is... 
there are some of us here. Um, <laughs> Generation Katniss is named after Generation Katniss Everdeen from The Hunger Games. Yes, because I think when we think about this generation, we think immediately about technology and we think about them being shaped by that force. I think we think less about how they've been shaped by two other very, very strong forces. One is the recession, the economic environment in which they've grown up, this world of austerity, a world in which they've seen their parents or friends of their parents lose their jobs, in which they've seen the consequences of subprime mortgages and overconsumption. They've been shaped by this even more profoundly than perhaps I had initially realized. And, they, and they've also been shaped by this world of existential danger and threat, which is now piped into their smartphones. Um, so they see the beheadings on Facebook. Yeah. They see Boko Haram tragedy on their Twitter feeds. And what's happening is that, very disturbingly, this generation I found, and I surveyed over a 1,000 teenage girls, this generation is profoundly anxious. Well, I want to come back to that in a minute because I mean, I notice this myself, just looking at the books that my own daughters are reading. I mean, when I was their age, I was reading Nancy Drew. I was reading Swallows and Amazons, for those of you who in the audience are British. Um, this generation are reading stories about cancer, about dystopia, about evil governments. I mean, it's The Fault in the Stars. Mm. It's um, all these other books about struggling against the state, mm. which is extraordinary. I mean, what do you think are the biggest fears of this Generation K, and how does that differ from the millennial generation? Well, I think the millennials really grew up, um, I call them the yes we can generation. This was a generation who grew up in much better, were shaped by much better economic times. Their parents told them the world is your oyster. Um, and, and that created a certain type of persona and personality. This generation, for them the world is less oyster, more nightmare. I mean, it's a bit this, we is, can't what get the we, generation this K is what here. we have bequeathed you. And I apologize. I apologize as somebody is part of the generation that's left this for you. But for this generation, life is like the dystopian nightmare of Katniss Everdeen's Hunger Games. For this generation, life is unequal, harsh, violent, unfair. Um, and, 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 and so 75% are really worried about terrorism. 66% really worried about climate change. 85%, and we're talking about teenagers here, 85% really worried about getting a job. 77% really worried about getting into debt. Teenagers we're talking about. And so, Teenagers. And a lot of them don't want to have children. Yes. Fascinating. 35% um, of this generation, 35% are unsure if they want to have children or definitely do not. This is considerably higher than previous generations. So what's the good news? <laughs> <laughs> there is good news. There is good news. I mean, one of the things that I found um, and it was wonderful to see, was that out of all the things that they were worried about, and you know, we know they are an anxious generation, but out of all the things they worried about, the thing that worried the most was inequality. Economic inequality, social inequality, gender inequality. These girls are horrified at the persistence of gender pay gaps. I mean, it's incredible. You, can talk, you talk to a teenage girl about gender pay, they've got facts, figures at their fingertips. They'll tell me, oh, did you know that a male nurse gets paid more than a female nurse? Did you know that women get paid 75 cents on the dollar compared to men? They know this, and they find it profoundly unfair. They, it's not only gender, they, they um, celebrate 
transgender rights, 90% of this generation support transgender rights. Yeah. And they, you know, it's a misnomer to think of them as the selfie, selfish generation. They may be taking their selfies, but they are not selfish. And they recognize that in this dystopian world, they're willing to step up to the plate themselves. They want to do something themselves, like their heroine Katniss Everdeen, to fix the wrongs that are out there. And that is inspiring. But hopefully with a much happier ending. Um, yes. Do you think, though, that this is a permanent set of values, or will they just grow up, grow up and grow out of it? It's a really good question. And when I started researching this generation, I think anyone who thinks about generational shifts needs to ask themselves, what are the traits I'm seeing which are perhaps the traits just of teenagers? And what are the traits I'm seeing which are likely to endure? And when I studied the academic literature on generational shifts, what was clear was that values values typically did endure. If you looked at how somebody was politically, you know, in a broad sense, what their political values were at 18, these were the values pretty much that they would have 40 years later. So I've been trying to tease out what, what is it about them that not only teaches us about them today, but also gives us a window into the right. future. So, if you are sitting there as the mother of some Generation K kids, um, or their employer, or you're trying to be a politician, or run an NGO, or do anything with Generation K, um, what would be your advice for how to deal with this new generation and inspire them and really enable them to flourish, um, other than don't take away their cell phones? <laughs> don't take away their identities. Um, I asked the girls for the word that, most descri that best described them, one word that best described them. And time and time again, as I looked through th over a thousand replies, one word popped up, unique. This is a generation that celebrates difference, that celebrates diversity that celebrates their own independence. And if you're trying to reach them, whether you are a parent or a brand, a marketer, if you're a politician or an NGO, you have to understand this. This is fundamental. They have their own voice. They celebrate their own voice, which is fantastic and they want their own voice to be part of the conversation. They don't want to be dictated to. They want to co-create. They want to lead. And they desperately want to be heard. And, you know, when we were, when we were growing up, the message, you know, was not one of celebrating difference. It was not one of celebrating uniqueness. It was about fitting in. It was about blending in. I find it reassuring and hopeful that in a world of toilet gate and terrorism trauma, this generation is celebrating being unique. Well, that is both challenging, yeah. That is both challenging, but it's also incredibly inspiring for everybody sitting here today. And I'd like to say a round of applause, not just for Norina, who has written these fascinating articles, is doing this great research, but also let's just applause all the people in this room who are Generation K, who really are the future. So thank you.